We are live. Welcome to Review and Thoughts 2009's The Butterfly Effect 3 Revelations. Now, the film was first screened at the After Dark Horror Fest Film Festival before going straight to video with the theatrical release occurring internationally. Uh oh, another RE movie sequel title. DSD can word me about these. So. I enjoyed this movie more than I thought I would, and probably more than I should have. There will definitely be a number of jokes in this video. I will also get into some serious stuff. So, I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. So, content warning and or trigger warning, the movie features torture, kidnapping, gaslighting, xenophobia, murder, body horror, sexual assault and or rape, grief and mourning, and serial killing. So this movie is rated R and so is this video for the movie, not this video, the movie is rated R for graphic bloody violence, a strong sex scene including nudity, language, and some drug content. This video is rated R because I'm going to be discussing those things. It is not going to feature those things visually. So I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. And I might mm, I might spoil the first two movies in this video without um, without warning before. And when I get to the thoughts section, I will put up, if you look at the top of the screen, the spoilers tag. And when that is on, that means I'm spoiling the entire movie. So yeah, only after the review itself. Now, I want to make it clear, I don't hate, you know, whether you love these movies or hate them, I don't have a problem with you. And, let's see, yeah. And that brings us to, let's see. So yeah, this, this is one of those sequels that focuses on different characters in somewhat su similar circumstance but don't share characters with the film it's a sequel to, so it's like a Final Destination sequel, not a Saw sequel. And I don't go into any movie hoping to dislike it. And yeah, so I personally think it's fine for people who aren't a big fan of the genre subgenre to, to you know review it or share their thoughts on it. But I know not everybody feels that way, so here is a short list of time travel movies that I've watched. All six Terminator movies. Frequency, Back to the Future, the entire trilogy, 12 Monkeys, the movie, not the series. I might watch the series at some point. It looks interesting. Avengers Endgame, Deadpool 2, Men in Black 3, Paycheck, and Tenet. And I just realized I don't think I copied in the slasher stuff, so I'm just going to find that won't take very long at all and I think we have got it okay here we go so slasher movies I think every single Friday the 13th movie is watchable and enjoyable yes even the remake none of them rise to the level of being like great movies which I would say Halloween 1978 is Nightmare on Elm Street 6 and the 2010 remake are the only Nightmare on Elm Street movies to be less than great. Depending on when you ask me, my personal preference either lies with the two Wes Craven entries or movies 2, 3, and 4. I love Candyman 1992 and 2021. Candyman 2 is fine. Candyman 3 is garbage. The Child's Play movies are perfectly serviceable, although Seed of Chucky is garbage. The one positive I can say about it is that I've heard some trans people view it as trans positive, so that's great. I'm very happy for them. I haven't watched past Seed of Chucky. Maybe you can guess why. I don't know. Maybe I will eventually. I hear they're a lot better. The first Wrong Turn movie is fine. I haven't watched any of the sequels, but according to Phalus, they're pretty bad. 
American Psycho 2 is complete garbage and should not exist, and no, that has nothing to do with the fact that the killer is a woman. That's perfectly fine, but it doesn't understand the first movie at all, and if you don't, then you shouldn't be making a sequel. Like, just just call it something else. I don't mind the idea. Like, it's I, I think I only watched it once, and it was like 15 years ago or more, but I think it's like Mila Kunis is a college student killing other college students in college. That's fine. I I don't have a problem with a slasher movie that does that, but don't call it American Psycho. It has, like, yeah, I just, I'm passionate about the first American Psycho, and that's why I hate the second one. I have no problem with Mila Kunis. I think she is amazing in Black Swan. The first dentist is well made for what for what it is, obviously it's not for everyone, it's quite extreme. I haven't watched the sequel, I wouldn't mind, but I haven't found a copy. First Children of the Corn is great, except for the very ending, I haven't watched... But, oh, right, I did watch the second one. I remember almost nothing about it other than the church scene, which wasn't half bad. Other than that, it was just okay, from what I recall. My Bloody Valentine 2009 was fine, I hear that the original is much better. Those are the English... English not all of those are anguish, but they're all English. But yeah, so, you know, ones that are not, slasher movies that are not English, the, let's see, yeah, so for the fellow Danes, I love Final Hour, or in Danish, Sista Team, and I am just really quickly gonna find... I honestly love, so let's see, it is the, ah, uh, right, this is not a great, where's the fun, let's see, right, I know how to get to it, so, I haven't watched very many other Scandinavian ones, and the ones I've watched weren't particularly good. I do really, really love and recommend. It's it's currently on Vimeo. <sighs> okay, um, I'm gonna try. It's a, it's Greenlandic, and in Greenlandic, I think that's how you pronounce it. In English, uh, is it really not around here? Uh, let's see. In Shadows in the Mountains, in the Shadow of the Mountains, is the English title. And yeah, I guess I should just to be absolutely. Let's see. So if I enter into Vimeo, The Shadows of the Mountains. Ah. Uh, oh, right, right. Um, yeah, yeah, it finds it. It finds the movie. That movie is so freaking good. I think I gave it a pretty positive review, but I watched it again since. I'm not sure I gave it all the credit it deserves. It really is an excellent movie. If we're talking about movies that help inspire the genre, then I think Psycho is a masterpiece. And, you know, Psycho 2 and 3 are slasher movies. They're fine. I, I, I think Psycho 2 has a lot of strengths, for sure, but... Compared to the first one, it's like, yeah. And, yeah. Let's see. So, I think, yeah, yeah. Those, that is the entire list of slasher movies that I'm familiar with and the ones that I like. Maybe, uh, so a lot of what, I, the, the DVD, uh, a lot of the DVDs I put up behind me make sense. But, you might be wondering, what's the deal with the Terminator one? Well, this features a character who travels back in time to prevent murders. And that is a lot like Kyle Reese. So, and I also put Lost Season 6 up there. Has time travel. I like having a lot of DVDs back there. And, yeah, the entire... Butterfly Effect Trilogy, and the the box set of the first eight. I do own all 11. 
of the Friday the 13th movies. So, I'm going to be making some jokes in this video that should not necessarily be thinking as me, you know, thinking it's necessarily bad. I just find it very difficult not to MST3K everything I watch. And, let's see. Yeah, so I got this movie on sale, so anything negatively saying this is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to the first movie. The trailer's not the marketing. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I said in this video are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. So yeah, in a lot of ways, this movie is like the first two in the series. So I'm not going to mention all the things where they're similar. I'm going to talk about the ways that they're different from one another. So I'm not just repeating myself from those videos. So yeah, you... You can go into this having not watched the, the first two, and, and really, I do kind of respect that about both of these sequels. You can go into them not having watched the first movie, and in the case of this one, the second movie. And, yeah, you know, that's, if, if you don't want to go back and watch the other, and certainly, I think a lot of the people that this appeals to wouldn't necessarily care that much about the first one, because it's a completely different movie. And really, the second one is also very different from this one. In, in some, You know, this is the only of the three that's a slasher movie. So, and, but, but yeah, you know, as I've hopefully by now made clear, I love both time travel movies and slasher movies. And I'm not, like, I don't think that this movie is automatically inferior to, you know, I don't hold the second movie in very high regard, but I do love the first one. I don't think that this movie is a bad movie just because it's a very different movie from the first one. I really don't think, you know, I, I feel like the second movie went above and beyond in proving we really don't need a sequel to the butterfly effect that just tries to be the butterfly effect again. It's like, no one no one asked for this. This is not what... I'm, I'm sure some people did, but... We don't need more of this. You know, you could just go back and watch the first one. So I appreciate that this t t is, is very different. And this is my first viewing. I watched it today right before hitting record. So... Yeah, the the plot. The IMDb summary does a pretty good job. Sam Reed uses his power to time travel to solve the mystery of his girlfriend's death. Which right there tells you that it is a time travel police procedural. And I'm going to be honest, I haven't seen... Of, like, I guess what comes closest is the time cop... Right, I forgot to mention those. I watched both time cop movies. I don't know why. But those do have police work and time travel, you know, but even those are very different from this. But honestly, yeah, if you're like a big fan of Van Damme, which I was in the 90s and the early 2000s, the first Time Cop is a fairly enjoyable movie for Van Damme fans. So I think... I think, ah, is that a spoiler? I'm just going to say that there is also a, a serial killer involved in, in this, and yeah, it's, it's interesting. And yeah, actually, I, th I think this is a, a pretty good, uh, this is, yeah, this is from one of my fellow critics, Sam uses his talents to earn a living as a remarkably accurate psychic, in quotes, for the Detroit police. He provides his contact, Detective Glenn, Lynch Travis, precise details about the crime and the perpetrator because Sam goes back in time and observes the crime while it's being committed. That's not a spoiler, and it's, that's legitimately a kind of neat, like, you know, parts of the second was also the lead trying to make a living or make money off of his time travel ability, but 
yeah, this is this is different. And you know, before you say, you know, why doesn't he stop the crime? Well, his mentor, who has time travel knowledge, says that you can never intervene. You can only observe. Otherwise, you shouldn't be time traveling. And let's see. That brings us to the, yeah, on the technical side, the, the people here are very talented, and it's, you know, I'm going to be criticizing parts of this, but I'm not calling into question anyone's skill or enthusiasm. And, yeah, so this was written by Holly Bricks who has five TV writing credits, including Vampire Diaries. And she, well, let's see. Right, this is, right, here we go. Yeah, she wrote two movies, this one and the 2014 movie, the Lost Girls, which I'm just really brief. I looked it up before, but I forgot. Oh, wait, never mind that. There's more than one movie called The Lost Girls. And there we go. That movie. Okay, I'm just gonna. Uh, yeah, this is the IMDb plot summary. Unknown to most of their prey, the Lost Girls are far from human. When their leader, Gracie, begins dying, that balance is thrown into jeopardy, and the Lost Girls must stop an, stop an erupting vampire revolution, race to find a cure, and conquer their own personal demons before it is too late. So yeah, that's... Uh, wait a second. The... She's listed as the writer on... Her own page, but not. Huh. Wait, did I? Okay, I am gonna move. Wow, there's. That's not her, The Lost Girls. There's two The Lost Girls from 2014, and that one wasn't hers, and I'm not even entirely sure. Um, nope, having trouble finding the. Ah. I'll go via Butterfly Effect 3. I swear I'm not going to spend forever on this, but that was... Never mind. I am moving to the... There we go. And... Holly Bricks. There are almost no details about her, The Lost Girls, from 2014, on IMDb at all. It says it's a horror movie, and there was a novel. That's that's all it said. But yeah, so I, I can't compare very much to, to... Yeah. I think that the the writing... Some of it is legitimately... I'm not sure the word is good. You know what? I'm grading on a curve. For what this is, some of the writing is actually good. There is psychological accuracy, and the different characters speak in different ways, which is something, you know, some, some people don't get that right. And it is kind of just, if, if you have a movie where, like, five people talk in the exact same way, it just gets kind of tedious to listen to. For example, you know, you should be able to tell people apart. Even if one of them is trying to be like the others, you know, there should be subtle differences. I think that the idea, like this, this thing of how it, uh, you know, sometimes when Sam wakes up, things will have changed, like in the other ones. You know, when, when he uh, wakes up. Yeah, when, when he returns from having traveled through time, 
things will have have changed, you know, and I wish I could really follow the logic of it because it doesn't seem yeah, but there are some some of the writing is good for what it is. Quoting fellow critics, there are so many problems with the logic in this particular film that made it hard to watch. It's short and has a good pace, so it is watchable. As long as you don't think too much, it's pretty predictable too. And let's see. Plot holes become apparent to which any child could notice. Two out of five watch if you have time to kill. Yeah, some people say it's not scary. Yeah, I don't think it's even trying to be. Like, there are slashers that try to be scary. You know, once again, the Candyman movie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think all three, all four Candyman movies are trying to be scary. It's just that the third one is and not it's not any good at it, but, you know. And some slasher movies, it's just, you know, here's a lot of gore, you know, which is... I think, I would definitely say Jason X isn't really trying to be scared. Like, it's trying to be cool, for sure. It's trying to be hip and with the kids, which it really, really isn't. But it's basically just a lot of gore, and you're just, you know, that's, yeah. And that's also, like, if you just want to watch a, a slasher, I'm not sure I would really recommend this. I, I think if you, if you really, really want a movie that is time travel, police procedural, and slasher, yeah, this, this, you know, it'll scratch that itch. Now, let's see. Yeah, one of my fellow critics pointed out, it's more of a thriller than a horror because it focuses more on the protagonist than the actual serial killings. And let's see. Yeah. The problem here is the increasingly tedious, quoting a fellow critic, the increasingly tedious bent of Holly Bricks' screenplay, with the growing emphasis on Sam's serial killer investigation, paving the way for a fairly tedious and uninvolving midsection, i.e. the movie starts to feel like a generic network television cop procedural past a certain point. It subsequently becomes more and more difficult to work up any interest in or sympathy for Sam's exploits. And again, uh, let's, uh, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> yeah, so. This time, the movie adds a few new elements. Sam can travel back to any moment in the past, whether he was present there when it originally happened or not. He doesn't need to use journals, pictures to travel back, and can do so at his will any time. And, yeah, um, I get that they kind of needed for that to... I mean, it just it makes me wonder, like... Does that mean that there's two of him until he, you know, while, while he is traveling back, until he goes back to the present? Or is it... Did, did he physically move the younger version of himself? And if so, like, does the younger version get freaked out that... Yeah. I am... It, it just... It raises questions that it's not interested in answering, and I'm not saying that every every question needs answering, but it's just kind of distracting, like, wait, how is this happening? And if you really don't, like, if you're asking how is this happening in a movie, 
unless it's like David Lynch or David Cronenberg or something. You know, you got to hit up one of the Davids for that. Unless it's that. Like, this movie is supposed to be straightforward. You know, this is supposed to be turn off your brain entertainment. It's, it's a, you know, like, there are slasher movies that try to make you think this isn't one of them. And it's just, yeah. Anyway, moving on. And... Yeah. In this one, the main character, Sam, travels by just focusing on the past and his sister, Jenna, monitors him, but then he seems to forget the intervening years when he returns to the present. The other problem is that sometimes characters and relationships are unclear, and a couple of times I had to ask my wife who this person was, why this person thinks that now, thinks that now, but she understood it pretty well, felt that the confusion was intentional, so the audience would feel like the main character who's really confused by all the time travel. And let's see. Breaks the script while not perfect is miles ahead of its predecessor. Well, the second one, not the first one. In terms of creating a film that is more plot than gimmick. I thought the I I love the plot of the first one, but yeah, to each their own. At least when the movie starts, Sam already knows about time travel. We don't have to go through the rigmarole of him discovering it. I really appreciate Yeah, that... Because the second one, like... We get it. We don't need to, to go through... Like... Who sits down to watch Butterfly Effect 2 without understanding the, the key... Like... Even if you haven't watched the Butterfly Effect one, and this isn't really a spoiler, it's it's introduced early. Basically, the idea is if you travel back in your own past and change one significant thing, then your future will be greatly affected by that. And yeah, you know, you it's, I it took me what 10, 20 seconds to explain that you don't need like I forget how much of the second movie passes before that's just completely confirmed, but it just, I, I, yeah, I guess, honestly, thinking about it, I'm not sure it was even all that long, but I, I just, I wish the movie had started with him, you know, like, yeah, time traveling, like, almost immediately, as a, anyway. Yeah. In in the first movie, Evan went back in time with a plan. However, in Revelation, Sam was clueless and clumsy when he jumped several of the times he jumped back. There was no apparent purpose of his time travel, and it would become obvious that things were not going to end in his favor. Yeah. And Yeah, we never get any real indication that the world has changed significantly after each jump to the past. One of the strengths of the first movie was how different the realities were that the protagonist created. This was, after all, the reason it was called the butterfly effect. In this movie, the extent of, his, of some of his jumps... Uh, yeah, there aren't enough significant changes. And... Yeah, and there are some scenes that, you know, are completely different in tone than the rest of the movie. And, you know, this critic points out, it's not a problem that they're extreme. It's a problem that they're, you know, they stand out so much. If the entire movie was like that, you know. Like, I'm not a huge fan of the original Saw, but as extreme as it is... It has a very consistent tone. There isn't really a scene in that movie that you watch and like, wow, that really doesn't fit. You know, it, it's not non-stop violence and gore, but it's bleak all the way through. And the, it has that kind of 
washed out look to the colors that's consistent all the way through, you know. So, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, the, the murder plot needed a couple of rewrites. And... Let's see. Yeah, the final scene is nonsensical and awful. Struggle with it, and you might be able to make up a better movie in your head. Yeah. And... Yeah, I fail to understand that when he interferes in past events, he sometimes wakes up in the bath of icy water where he started, but at other times returns to find himself on a couch. And yeah, it just, like... If it always changed, then, okay, that's just the logic of the film. It always changes, no matter what he does in the past. Or, you know, yeah, when he, oh, wait, actually, come to think of it, is that it? Is it when he changes nothing that he wakes up in the ice? Is it sad that I already don't remember? I, I just got done watching the movie, and I already don't remember all of the scenes where he wakes up after time travels. Yeah, anyway. The movie starts right away having already traveled back in time and affecting a big change. Also a point in its favor. Now... Let's see. Right, the... Um, I guess that's kind of a spoiler. Anyway. <coughs> Butterfly Effect 3 seems determined not to copy the original film slavishly like the first sequel did, and it is indeed sufficiently different to hold your interest. The side, or should I say butterfly, effect of that is to... that is... that its concept of time travel is less internally consistent than that of the previous two movies. Here the hero sometimes go, goes back to places he's been in the past by getting inside his younger self's brains. Sometimes, if he contrasts hard enough, he goes back to places and times he's never been in. Which means he time travels physically and not just mentally. Which is also like, wouldn't you expect him to then show up? Well, no, wait, I guess after he returns to... Yeah, because the... Because the, the past him goes on to live a lot. Okay, yeah. And... I think that is... Yeah, in closing, about the writing, I really thought that, like, it kept me invested. And I actually read a lot of spoilers before, but, yeah, it's, yeah. And, and some of the characters I, you know, liked seeing more of and liked seeing the different versions of. Now, the direction is handled by Seth Grossman. I don't know... I don't know if his parents were psychic. Maybe they traveled in time. Or if he decided to try to live up to his last name. But, yeah. This movie's gross, man. And I'll, I'll get into more details later on that. But yeah, he is let's see, he produced seven he has seven TV producing credits. He has 
He produced one movie, one short. American Pork. So, like a, a documentary on... Oh, wow. Didn't see that coming from, but I get, I don't know, maybe he just had to agree to the script. But he did embrace it, though. Anyway, yeah, he has directed four movies in total, including two after this. So this didn't, like, sink his career. Like, it also didn't for the writer. Or at least not completely. And he also directed The Elephant King. He directed a short. Wait, he directed two shorts and some TV. Right, this is actually the only movie he has directed that he didn't. Oh, never mind. Two of the other movies that he directed, he also wrote. So that might also be an issue with this one. And. I am just going to go. Yeah, so going into the critic quotes. Story is naff. Was bored about halfway through and managed somehow to stay awake till the end. Nor near as good as the original. Not surprising as the budget was lower. And yeah, I, I wouldn't quite go that far. And Director Seth Grossman achieves some effective shocks from small, unexpected moments, but when it comes to the overall story, he's limited by Holly Bricks' script, which uses the original butterfly effects time paradox mythology nothing more original than a murder mystery with slasher overtones. It gives away nothing to note that the law of diminishing suspects always applies in murder mysteries and the suspects disappear quickly in this movie. And let's see. There's solid nuts and bolts craftsmanship in the two films released on this Blu-ray and this actors. I'm, I'm guessing... No, I actually don't know what the other one is. The actor certainly can't be faulted for making the most of what's on the page. Let's see. As is usually the case with contemporary films, it's what's on the page that the, that's the source of the problems. And... Grossman's direction is interesting as well, but flawed. Some very nice moments in the film are undercut with overlong scenes and sloppy editing. <laughs> Several times in the movie, I caught myself mumbling the word cut to myself with increasing urgency. Good lines of dialogue that should have ended the scene were lost in unnecessary further expository jibber-jabbering by the actors. And what impressed me the most about the film was the direction. I really liked a lot of the establishment shots of buildings, the skyline, and the city, along with some nice shots of birds in flight, etc. It really added a lot of mood, I thought. Also, the basic structure and look of the film was done very well, too. I agree. Yeah, if, you're, if we're grading on a curve, and we are, this is fairly decently directed. It's it at times the direction is good for what it is. Let's see. The story meandered too much, giving us multiple timelines and outcomes which were hard to untangle. Things were not clear. In comparison, for example, in the first film there was zero confusion and the timelines harmonized together perfectly. Let's see. They were permanently talking about people I don't know. 
I was confused not only once. The complexity of the characters is just not there at all. I don't. Let's see. Yeah, I gotta agree with this. Okay, so, yeah. Quoting fellow critic, what confused me the m even more was that hip hop soundtrack. I mean, I'm cool with hip hop. I listen to hip hop every day since I'm guessing 10 years of age. But that soundtrack, rapping something about the rough street life, had completely nothing to do with the movie. Yeah, I, I, I. I enjoyed it. I would listen to it like, you know, when not watching this movie, but it did not fit. Like, and, and the first time it kicks in is like right after, like Sam just came back from time travel and, you know, so he witnessed a murder and then he goes to the police station to tell them who, you know, yeah, to, to give information, and, and, yeah, like, I mean, if you want, if the music should be communicating something very directly, instead of, like, it could just be going off of, like, wow, that was kind of creepy what we just saw, but if it's supposed to be saying something very clearly, it should be something like, this burden is weighing on me, you know, it, it, it hurts so much to keep watching people die, something like that, but not, like, rough life on the street, like, people who have a rough life on the streets can't relate to time travel so you can't really make like and and actually yeah if the movie had started with something like that and then the killing and then you know but no it's yeah so the the opening of the movie i guess i i don't especially want to give too much away i'm just going to say that I, it, it, it felt extremely cheap at a time when the movie really should be like making a good impression. It really, like, I, I get it. I've watched other slasher movies from the mid to late 2000s. You know, they, they, there's a lot of bleakness and bitterness in them. You know, there's there's not really the, you know, like, if you look at 80s slashers, some of them would have, like, a youthful energy to them. You know, like, if you watch a Friday the 13th movie, you know, oh, you know, it's, it's like young people, you know, doing stuff that they know they, they aren't really allowed to do, but, hey, there's no adult supervision, so they're doing it. And, just, you know, and then you have this, which is just kind of just bitter and, that, like... If the opening scene was a person, it would spit in your face. And yeah, the heh, yeah, I'm not gonna give away whether the ending is happy or sad. In some ways, it fits what came before. I don't think the ending is particularly good, but I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure that there could have been a good... Honestly, I could understand. There's probably people who love this ending. And I don't really blame them. The... Yeah, let's see. I wouldn't really... Uh, hmm. There's, there's some convenient writing. I wouldn't really say Deus Ex Machina, but convenient writing... Not sure it was that much more convenient than the rest of the movie, though. And the ending titles, like, yeah, you know, some of it is to, like, rap music. I'm not sure how to, what what the other genre of, of music, you know, they, they play at least two, I guess, entire tracks. So, yeah, entire songs, not entire tracks. And, yeah. I like the music. I'm not sure there's really anything else. You know, it's it's the it's the boring kind of end credits where it's just like black background, white text, slowly scrolling. You know, slowly because they really gotta try to make this seem like a feature length movie, which 
not quite, uh, or I guess just depending on your definition, but it's it's a it's a short movie. And that brings us to the characters. So I would say largely the acting was good. I, you know, some some of the actors have to play their character in very varied circumstances and are pretty convincing in the different ones. Chris Carmack plays Sam Reed. And, yeah, uh, one of my fellow critics says he's nothing brilliant, but he holds his own most of the time. Yeah, I, I mean... There are a couple of times where he has to depict fairly intense emotion, and I thought he was largely convincing. I, yeah, I think the the there were a couple of times where I didn't love the performance, but I think he was basically doing the best he could with the written material he was given, and he had to. I, I'm not sure this director is the best actor's director. Rachel Miner plays Jenna Reed. Minor, quoting fellow critics, Miner's performance nails a character really well, and when she's on screen, the movie really comes to life. Miner, best known for her relationship to the Home Alone kid, I guess in real life, I don't think she's been in a Home Alone movie, so anyway, shines in this movie to the extent that she overshadows Carmack's heavy-handed take on his character. This appears to be a problem with the direction or casting, as the acting is... Yeah. Minor proves that all the performances... Let's see... Rachel Minor does very well as the sister Jenna. She's unpredictable, and I dug her. Yeah, I honestly... She was she was the, the high point of the, like, character-wise. I mean, it's... At the end of the day... The, in the in the second movie, in Butterfly Effect 2, he's just selfish and douchey and kind of annoying and not that easy to relate to unless you're very much like him. In the first movie, like Evan, you know, I'm not telling anybody that they have to like Ashton Kutcher. I am aware, like, you know, I've, I've noted... When he is most convincing in that movie is when he is playing a douchey frat bro, you know. But he he is fairly convincing in most of the movie. And at the end of the day, that character is trying to make things better. He is actually, like, really devoted to trying to, to change people's lives for the better. And then you have Sam, who's, like, at the start of the movie, you know, okay, he doesn't love seeing people die over and over, but he is, like, and, and he gives people closure. He is helping solve unsolved mysteries, you know, it's, so it's not nothing. And there is one part where he says, I just want to help people. But for so much of this movie, he's like going around trying to solve this murder mystery. And it's just that doesn't make for a hugely engaging character, you know, and, and that by itself is not bad. It's not it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Uh, you know, some some movies are excellent, even though, like in the first Matrix, like. Neo is a blank slate. He's a he's a self-insert character. He's a he's a male power fantasy. That's all. But there's other stuff in that movie to help make up for that. And I'm not sure I would really say that's the case here. Like again, like if you're if you just want to see time travel and someone wake up and be confused about the the what has happened in the time between, you know, it's it's like the it's um it's like a downgraded version of the first movie, which, you know, that is, it's it's a direct-to-video sequel. I'm, I'm not blowing anybody's mind by pointing out that it's a lesser version, you know. I'm not even the first person, obviously, to point that out, but, yeah, you know, that that's something it has, and then it has this, like, what's the word? Yeah, this, this murder mystery thing going on, 
and then it has the slasher thing. And yeah, I mean, if I had to guess, I think they were basically hoping that people, you know, they were hoping for teenagers going through Blockbuster back when that existed, you know, just looking for a slasher they hadn't watched before and say, oh, wow, this is a slasher with time travel. Okay, that's what we're watching tonight, you know. And yeah, if if that's if you just want to see some some gore, you know, this does a perfectly fine job at that. But it really is a it could be so much more, you know. And and that is one thing like even if you hate Ashton Kutcher's acting, if you just look at like the the lines, the dialogue, and the characters' actions in that first movie, you really do get a sense that this is, I mean, you know, it's a fairly easy way to get the audience involved. This is a guy who wants to do something good. Let's watch him try to do something good, you know. It's not brain surgery, but, yeah, it works, you know. it's And, and that's actually... I think it was important for that movie. It 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 has a chance of really confusing people. There there's way more time travel in it than any time any one time travel movie that had come before it. And yeah, it it really risked alienating the audience. So it was important that we empathize and sympathize with the main character. And really we spend most of the first movie on his side, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna, I guess I'm not gonna talk here about whether or not he eventually loses our sympathy, but, you know, yeah, for a good chunk of it, it's like, we, we want him to time travel again, we want him to fix things, and with this movie, I don't know, I, I guess, I'm not sure I care that much if Sam, I, I mean, what's, what's the word, like, the, I guess if the mystery was better, I think if the mystery, like a, a good murder mystery, will really have like I'm, I love I love the old school stuff like Agatha Christie adaptations from the seventies, and I love some of the newer stuff. You know, I've I've watched a lot of of those. Yeah, yeah. I for for years I watched NCIS, for example, Law and Order. I feel like there's one more, but it's, yeah, but, you know, I've watched a bunch of these. I love a good murder mystery, and this ain't it, you know, maybe, yeah, I guess maybe they should have gotten one of the screw, one, one of the writers from, from one of the writer rooms of one of those shows to pitch in and come and help spruce up the murder mystery, because, yeah, it's just, it's not that compelling to, to watch him go around, you know, finding some evidence and, and dealing with it, just, yeah. And I, I'm not sure I'm going to talk too much more about the other actors. Yeah. And... I couldn't figure out who the hell all these women were or even follow their names. So many characters and you don't know anything about them. Yeah, you know, eventually the movie answers questions, but, you know, too little too late. Yeah, it's just... Yeah, I, I literally, when, on some of the time travel jumps, I was just I was just sitting and trying to figure out, wait, who's this again? What's what's her relationship to Sam? And and it's just Yeah, I I Actors play the roles very convincingly. Rachel Miner especially hit it out the park. 
eclipsing Chris Carmack in every scene that they share. And yeah, some people really hated Jenna and Rachel Minor as her. Yeah, so I wrote myself a note here to notice if this movie had any side characters, any at least one side character as fun as Thumper from the original movie. No, not not at all. And that's actually yeah, that brings up another major part of the original movie was the interpersonal relationships between these characters. I already mentioned it's about Evan wanting to to do good, and that's not this like you know that's if you just like elevator pitch maybe but the detail of that is that he's trying to help his friends his childhood friends have better lives because he feels that they deserve better than they got and that's like you know ideally we should all be able to re relate to that be able to look at some you know one or more of our friends and be like I wish I could help them. I wish their life was better because I've known them for so long and they deserve better. And here, like, we barely even remember the, the different people. Like, I think the reason there are so many characters is so that there can be more, like, you know, they, they needed more characters to kill off, you know, and it's just... Again, I'm not saying every slasher needs to make a big deal out of it. You know, some of the Friday the 13th movies, for example, don't. Although, was there ever a time... I, I would argue every single... Yes. Every single major character in one of those movies, you know what they, like, what their job is or what their, you know... Like, you, you know at least a little bit about them. None of them are just complete nothings. And here, like, there are a number of these characters. I I don't know who they... I don't... Like, even if... Okay, I can, I can look at Wikipedia to match name with face. Okay, that's a start. But I don't know what their job is, what their interests are. Like, nothing. And at that point, like, why am, why am I caring about like obviously I don't want them to die I don't want them to suffer but like you can't just you know put a character in front of a camera and say okay now audience be invested in what happens to the you know a, a, like if you have like a killer visibly chasing after them I'll I'll hope that they make it but a lot of the movie, it's just like, we, we know, okay, this person, like, died in the past, and now he's trying to, you know, Sam is trying to figure out how, how can he save them in the past, you know, and so, they're just, you know, yeah, some of them, they're just, they're a, they're a face on a, on a photograph, and we've been told that they've died, and Sam badly wants to travel back in time to save them. And it's just like, yeah, it's it's a it's a very human, it's a good thing to do to save lives. Because, you know, they're innocents, they were murdered. But you just can't expect me to get that invested when I don't know these people. And Sam is like, he's not that, like, there are times where he, he comes across as kind of histrionic. And I, I have empathy for him. But, like, I'm watching and I'm like... I don't think you should be traveling so much in time. I think you need therapy. You know, like, just, I... I can't be fully invested in a movie if I'm sitting there thinking, oh, this is gonna... He's, he's, you know, can can you just... Like, it's, it's like if you see a movie and someone is, like, bleeding and no one is doing anything to stop it. Like, I can't focus on anything. Stop the bleeding, you know? I can't focus on anything else until you stop that bleeding. And that's... Yeah, too too much of this movie is just like I get why he's upset. I get why he's traumatized. But it's just yeah, I I don't think I'm I, I'm not gonna give away in the in the review itself. What I'm gonna say is 
you will find out in the movie itself why he is traumatized. And I do think it is legitimately, you know, it's it's psychologically accurate. I don't know if it's like mind-blowingly good writing, but it's it works for what it, you know, it's it's just there to get us you know it's 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 background it's it's that's essentially what it is it's not something that you spend a long time in the movie thinking about but i bought it you know i i believe that he's traumatized by that but yeah like cuz cuz again you know when you go back to evan in the first movie you know he's seen some really messed up things and like i mean he does have trauma yes but at the end of the day like when you see the look on his face when he realizes that a time jump worked that one of his friends is happy you know just the the goofy grin he gets and it just he's he's just so happy to be able to to make other people happy and again i'm not saying it's some genius they didn't they didn't crack the code or something it's basic stuff but it works and this movie doesn't have that basic stuff so the uh, yeah so the IMDb quote section only has 7 which is not very much for a feature film like the other day i was looking over one that had over 100 as as a comparison point and you know i i try to go over you know how many of them are good how many of them are bad they're all pretty bad if i were. actually i'm going to do a really quick check so let's oh wow yeah, that's pretty bad. Bad. Okay, that one's kind of... That one's not bad. But, okay, yeah, so... The... the of the seven quotes... Five of them are bad, and three of them have homophobia, which, like, the writer is a woman, so I don't, yeah, I don't know, I guess she felt like after the, the second movie had homophobia, they needed to, and if I'm being 100% honest, the first movie as well, I didn't say it was a perfect movie. That brings us to the cinematography, which was handled by Dan Stoloff, who has 20 movie cinematography credits, 17 TV credits, 6 short credits, 1 camera department TV credit, and I gotta say, I haven't even heard of the rest of the stuff that he's... But, yeah, you know, again, this movie didn't end his career. He made, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Eight movies after this so yeah yeah most of his stuff like he did one in 1992 but other than that it's 1999 until 2013 so yeah and like some of these do sound like other teen movies let's see there's okay vampirifica almost sounds like children's vampire so anyway which, you know, that happens, that exists. Uh, the Little Va Vampire, I think it's called. It's got the annoying kid from... Uh, Jerry Maguire. And he's just as annoying. Anyway, the... Um, yeah. Okay, so... Six-month rule, cougar hunting, labor pains, childless... Wedding Days, spelled D-A-Z-E, so I'm guessing it's like pot. Screen Door Jesus. Yeah, these sound, you know, that's, that's what Dan does, I'm guessing. But yeah, the, let's see. The cinematography, yeah, right, quoting fellow critics, the cinematography was also solid. My one only complaint about the cinematography is that sometimes it felt claustrophobic. We're always inside someone's apartment or in some dark, cramped place. I guess that fits with the theme, but I would have liked to be able to breathe every now and then with a nice landscape shot or something. Maybe that was also a budget issue. Photographer. 
is a handheld camera kind. Keep shaking as it follows the events. It's not like obnoxiously shaky. I wasn't like, you know, hugely bothered by it. I do think that I, I get, you know, wanting to be able to breathe. I think it really fits the the whole, you know, bleak thing. Might have been a budget issue. I think it was the right choice. And the movie's so short anyway. So the editing was handled by Ed Marks. And he is editing to this day. So, yeah, this movie did not ruin his career or anything. And, again, never heard of this stuff. But some of it definitely sounds like it is... Yeah, he, he edited a movie called Zombievers. One called Zombex. Hatchet 3, Hatchet 2. Frozen, not the Disney one, but the 2010, you know, people stuck on a ski lift one. It's it's a perfectly fine movie. YMS apparently hates it based on some of the clips I've seen, but I thought it was all right. Like, it, you know, it's basically just cashing in on, like, people who, you know, use ski lifts. Of course, there's, like... The, you know, you can't help but worry, what if the ski lift just stops suddenly? What if we have to stay here for hours in the, you know, extreme cold kind of thing? You know, it's it's that, like, th the way that Friday the 13th is, what if there was a serial killer at your summer camp? You know, it's, it's fine. And certainly some of the editing in that movie is very effective, I think. He edited Jeep, right, Jeepers Creepers 1 and 2. I don't know if I want to admit that, but yeah, I watched those. I'm glad that, uh, what was it, Victor, I'm going to really quick look at his name so that I do not besmirch, besmirch some innocent guy's name. Whoops, that is not how you spell. Wow, I really, I don't usually misspell things. Victor Salva, I'm glad he went to jail. He is a creep. Indeed. I did not mean to make a pun. He's a child molester, and they belong in prison. Anyway, the... Yeah, at times the editing is very jumpy, very ADHD. It's like they're scared the teen audience will be bored, if not. It's mostly in individual scenes, and it doesn't go on for very long. But, yeah, it was like... This, 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 there's this one time where he, like... He spends a few seconds looking at, like, ah, what's it called? Like, evidence. You know, the pictures of, of dead people or people who, you know, that, that kind of thing. And the, and the editing is, like, jumping around, like, trying to make... I mean, I get it. You know, they probably, like, they, they filmed it, and then they came into the editing room, and they were like, wow, this is, this is stale, this is static. What can we do with this? So they, they jazzed it up in the editing, but I wish they had just left it bad. Left it the other kind of bad, I mean. And... Yeah, so, the special effects. One critic says the effects are on the poorer side, the blood looked like chocolate. But another said the special effects are good. The CGI is kept to a minimum. That is very true. And that, oh boy, there was a lot of CGI in slashers and movies in general around this time. And it's really good that the CGI, yeah. I, uh, there were definitely effects that were very well handled. And like, yeah. But it, yeah, I, d I don't especially have a lot negative to say about the the effects. They were they were perfectly fine. And let's see. Yeah, so I did not find any details about the budget of this movie. But the, yeah, I mean, based on the DVD B-roll, it looked like it had a higher product, you know, 
did it? Some parts of it had a higher budget, uh, production value than the second one. But yeah, and, you know, doesn't have as high a production value as the first one. Not by a long shot. But yeah, and the box office was seven hundred and eight thousand dollars under fifty two under fifty two dollars, right? And yeah. Quoting a fellow critic, this is a no-budget job, consisting mostly of people talking to each other in order for the flick to run more than a half hour. Yeah. Sadly, very true. And let's see. And yeah, it's it's set in Detroit and it was actually filmed there. At least some of it was. Some of it was filmed in Vancouver. But yeah. I, I mean, again, it's fairly basic, but yeah, watching the movie, I felt like, okay, we're in Detroit. Some people can't manage that, as sad as that is to, you know, some people have a location, and they shoot stuff, and they edit, and you leave, and you, you don't feel like you actually visited it in the movie, you know. But yeah, it's, it's, you know, a lot of it is people talking to each other. Yeah. And the... Let's see. Right, so the composer... I am just going to very briefly look up if Wikipedia tells me how to pronounce I uh, hmm okay I think maybe if I do it like this it does not it does not so I am sorry dude I think you did a perfectly fine job with this movie I'm sure your name isn't actually pronounced Adam Balash, who has 22 movie credits as composer, and some of this appears to be his original, like, yeah, so I'm not even gonna try to pronounce these, but I'm guessing Serbian, maybe? something along the, right and actually yeah he also scored the elephant king with you know same director so i guess that might be how why he's doing it for for here i thought he did, did a perfectly fine job like when the movie is supposed to be like ah what's it, you know su suspenseful and tense it works Quoting a fellow critic, I like the score. Usually movies like this skip on those elements and just use a cheesy synth score, but this one was solid. And there are a couple of jokes in the movie. I'm not sure I thought any of them were funny. And yeah, so, you know, it's it's it jumps into the time travel much quicker than the first two and i do appreciate that that were that you know that choice because i do not think anybody needs to have it explained by this point in the franchise so the first movie is an hour and 49 minutes before the end credits start and then another 5 minutes of of credits which, you know, that's why there is the depth and substance to that movie that there is. Which, once again, I'm not saying is, like, it's not the best movie ever made. But for what it is, it is very, very good. The second movie is an hour and 17, or 18 minutes without end credits. And then, wow, almost, yeah, ten and a half minutes of end credits. And this one is, yeah, this wasn't... This is an hour, 17 and a half minutes. So, yeah. And it also manages to... Yeah, so about nine minutes of end credits. Which is how they have time for two entire songs. 
was there was there more than two? Anyway, and yeah, I mean, it is just the the both sequels have less to offer than the first one did. And at, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if you took away the time travel gimmick here and the the ultimately yeah there's not there's not that much to this movie it is as as a slasher like yeah i you know earlier i mentioned the the you know 2009 that was also the year that they remade my bloody valentine i mean i would definitely watch that before this oh wow Okay. If you love this movie, you may want to like skip ahead a few seconds, but I actually honestly I would probably rewatch the Friday the 13th remake. Okay, not the not the Nightmare on Elm Street re remake. But yeah, the Friday the 13th remake, I would rewatch that over this. It actually if if you're just looking for a slasher, if you're looking for tension suspense, like creative gory kills and just yeah i mean that's kind of sad you know i'm not saying that you know the moment that you start mixing genres you don't have to deliver 100 percent on that genre you know i mean there are several mcu movies that have cyborgs but since they also have other stuff that also has to be given attention to like you know if you want to watch an amazing movie about a cyborg, you know, Robocop is, you know, yeah. And, uh, right, in case you're, if you don't already know, I love the MCU, you know, and I do think they've done great job, great stuff with cyborgs. But yeah, like, you know, there are better time travel movies, better police procedurals, and better slashers, and the fact that this combines the three of them really doesn't amount to that much like it is just yeah you know elevator pitch you know you or you walk through blockbuster and it's there on the the shelf or you know maybe yeah i guess it's probably you know today you you scroll through a streaming service and you see oh wow there's there's a third butterfly effect what's it oh serial killer okay you know that's that's basically it other than that yeah Right, I try to note how much of the movie should you watch. I think, yeah, watch the first, if you know, if you really want to give this movie a chance at all, which I don't know if I'm really telling you to. I, yeah, probably not. But if you're, if you find the, the core concept interesting, you know, maybe watch the first 30 minutes. And if by minute 30 you are not interested in keep in, in continuing to watch the movie, you might as well stop it. It's not going to do anything after that to hugely win you over. So, yeah, this is where I'm supposed to talk about the best element of the movie. I guess I would say that the yeah i what i wrote before watching was the core concept and that is still i, I can't really think of anything better about the movie than just the core concept and like i said that doesn't really amount to very much you know yeah if you really love that idea maybe try to watch you know, don't don't spend very much money on it but yeah the worst aspect is the twist and i guess i didn't personally it didn't destroy the movie for me but i could understand if other people felt yeah actually i think i've seen some people who said the movie was good until the twist and, yeah, the worst aspect, according to others, is that it's too sleazy, and, yeah, it, I, there's no, 
it really didn't need to be anywhere near as as sleazy as it is and yeah like obviously that is a draw for some people and again you know i'm not a prude i'm not saying there's something wrong you know i have favorite horror movie what one of them i'm i find it very difficult to choose just one but one of my favorite horror movies 1982 is the thing that is an extremely gory movie so i am not bothered by violence that's not something that you know but yeah this movie it just didn't yeah and yeah the thing i was most worried about is that it would be as bad as the second movie and other direct to video fare and Yeah, direct to video fair. Yeah. Whether or not I like it better than the second movie, I will get to when I get to the rating. And yeah, you know, I was most looking forward to a new application of time travel to what I'd seen before, and the movie didn't really meet my expectations on that. And yeah, I've already gone into. I actually forgot to note whether or not the trailer gives away too much. I guess what I'll do is I will turn off the audio and I actually, yeah, I mean, I've, I've already watched it. I guess I just completely forgot to note. So I'm just really quickly going to look through. Hmm. I think I would yeah it gives away at least a little bit too much I would say but it also does give you a pretty decent idea of what the movie is like if you like the trailer you might like the movie the cover and post uh, yeah I'll, I'll do a real quick check of the cover and poster because they are on IMDB and it's direct to video so there's probably not very many of them so, four posters, and they are the exact same, all four of them. Yeah, not, you know, you can you can look at them without being spoiled, and they give you an okay idea. Like, it, it combines the butterfly thing, you know, yeah, the butterfly effect visual with this woman screaming from being killed by a serial killer. So, yeah, it, it does a pretty decent job of, yeah. One critic said that this could have been a TV series like Quantum Leap. I think that might actually, yeah. You know, this is, yeah, this is the part of the video where I go into, you know, if this shouldn't have been a movie, if it should have worked better for another medium, I think this should have been a TV show. And honestly, I think they didn't make it one because they figured there was more, it was a more secure investment to make a direct-to-video movie. I think that is what happened. Because yeah, honestly, this could have been an inter yeah like Quantum Leap meets like you know F NCIS or something. Yeah, I I think that could have been a, a quite. Because you just, yeah, you just, as long as there's a new murder mystery, you know, and yeah. And it would have livened up the main character if he was always solving these murders, you know, like, yeah, I would, I, I, you know, if instead of him being like, oh, you know, all these people are dying and looking at evidence and it not necessarily amounting to all that much, like, if instead, like, I, yeah, if he, like, Ah, what's a what's a classic? Yeah, yeah, like he, you know, he's he's he knows that he has the the right guy, and you know, he's just he's 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 good copping him. He's he's like, I know you didn't really hurt you. You would never hurt. Ah, what was? What was her name again? And, you know, the, the other, yeah, the, the killer 
reveals that he knows the name, even though they didn't release it to the public or some kind of, you know. But, yeah, I, that would have, yeah. He'd need a catchphrase. Moving on. No, seriously, I would, if this came if if they like okay i don't watch very many current shows if this came to disney plus as a tv show i would very seriously have to consider watching it yes so the yeah wow i found very little on youtube no one on youtube besides me cares about this movie there were two other vlog reviews there was an explained there were two pieces of music, which, you know, I, f I found them by title searching, by IMDb soundtrack credit. Or, wait, no, like, I found them by searching for the, the movie title, and then title searching by IMDb soundtrack credits, I found four more, found the same trailer twice. Mike Jeevan's shameful sequel video is still online, Google finds it, but it's not on YouTube. And honestly, if not for his, you know, he, he did a video on the second movie and one on the third. If he hadn't, I, I don't think I would even know that there were sequels to The Butterfly Effect. Because no one cares about these movies, you know. Again, I'm not unhappy I watched. I'm not like, you know, I didn't spend very much money on this at all. They were practically throwing them at you, you know, just... Yeah, cause cause they knew, you know, the the online store knew. No one's gonna buy this if it's not, you know. And if I recall, I think they even boxed. I think I bought two and three together because they were so worried about selling either of them completely on their own. But yeah, and it was like an eighth of what a movie normally costs. It was nothing. Anyway, there's no tomato meter. For this because there's only one review. The audience score on the other hand is 32% based on over 2,500 ratings. Yeah and the average yeah so 32% rated it 3.5 stars or higher. The average rating is 2.8 out of 5. Ouch. It's not on Metacritic at all because no one knows it, no one cares about it. And there were only 60... N normally, I read the top-voted 100 IMDb user reviews. There were only 68. So, but I... Yeah, I read them all, and... Yeah. So the... Let's see. Five of them voted 1 out of 10. No one voted 2. 6 voted 3. 4 voted 4. 10 voted 5. 16 voted 6. 11 voted 7, 9 voted 9, 4 voted 9, and 4 voted 10. So that's, yeah, the people who sought it out did actually really like it, and there were only 30 links to IMDb external reviews, and 10 of them are in English and still work. So, yeah. I'm starting to sound really down on this movie. I, I again... If you love this movie, that's perfectly all right. I I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Hypothetically, if you said that you thought that The Room was the most beautifully shot and edited and acted movie ever, that would be something we disagreed on. So this has a 5.5. On IMDb, based on 19,490 IMDb users who voted, and 25.3 voted 6, 20 voted, 20% 20 voted 5, 10.3 voted, oh right, 5.5 voted 3. Ah. Ugh, right, I messed that up. 10.3 voted 4, 5.5 voted 3, 7.6 voted 8, 4.8 voted 10, 3.3, 3.9 voted 1, 3.3 voted 2, and 2.6 voted 9. Yeah, I... I usually take issue with 
like if a movie is good, I I think it's very rare that you should vote a one for a movie. You know, it has to be extremely bad for that to make sense to me. I can I can understand people who gave this a ten. Like I I I was once like if I watched this when I was like fourteen, I would probably have given it very, very high rating. But yeah, so let's see the yeah the 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 gore I'm going to quote some fellow critics here. The main theme of this move of this one is more like a horror movie. In several scenes, people are seen getting cut up with a handheld soul-like device. Lots of blood and gore are seen. And yeah. So yeah. The let's see. Yeah. The you know one critic who usually loves sex scenes says that the sex scene is really boring, goes on for way too long, and yeah, quoting a fellow critic here. Others have remarked that the sex scene jumps overboard from the movie. I'd like to add that if you're keeping track of the script, you realize that the scene is important to the plot, but that it is supposed to be over with very quickly. The way it goes on and on may have added commercial value, but it turns a bit of the movie into nonsense. Yeah. And... Let's see... So yeah, I do recommend this movie to people who really love the idea of time travel, police procedural, and slasher being, you know, combined. Like, I've seen a lot of slashers that didn't have any police procedural elements, you know, so yeah, and the, the, yeah, moving on. So the, the DVD has... Or the the one I got, you know, make sure if if you are passionate about DVD special features, make sure you look to see if it's confirmed that it's yeah. But yeah, fifteen minutes of behind the scenes, it's it's edited B roll, you know, it's not one of the in depth behind the scenes. Fourteen and a half minutes of interviews, you know, some of it is Chris Carmack, some of it is Rachel Miner, some of it is director Seth Grossman, some of it is producer AJ Dix. And yeah, I mean the the cast are very charming and likable in their interviews. I you know, I thought that Sam was going to be a lot more charismatic based on the interview. And you can stream this on iTunes or Vudu. And yeah, so, I'm not sure I'm ever going to watch this movie again. I, you know, yeah, I already mentioned what I'd rather, what I might rather watch, and yeah, I rate this five observed events in the past out of ten. And once again, I'm grading on a curve here, because it really, yeah, ranking the trilogy worst to best Second movie, third movie, and first movie. I mean, at least it's not incredibly boring like the second movie. You know, I actually, you might think, if you watch that review of mine, you might think that was why I took this really long break between reviewing two and three, and it's not. The actual explanation is way nerdier and lamer, and I'm not going to get into it because I do enough self deprecating humor on this channel already. So, I, yeah, that brings us to the thoughts. There we go. So, the rest of this video contains spoilers for all three of these. And there is a, if, you know, if you want to watch my videos on the first two, there is a link in the description box to a playlist that has all of my videos on these three movies. 
So, the rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some is MST3K, MST3K riff tracks, and other jokes. And, yeah, so the two sections are thoughts that I had while watching, chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, like tweeting on the like. And the section after that is thoughts that I had before watching. So, I am just going to note the time code before diving in. So... Notes taken while watching. The movie's made in part by Infinity Features. I'm glad it goes to Infinity, but I do think we should go beyond. So, I noted, okay, I don't hate the relationship between little Josh and his mom. And then we realize, you know, we, we see Sam there watching, and I get, you know, I guess if you don't know what the, the concept is, you're supposed to think, oh, is Sam going to hurt them? But if you do know the concept, you're going to either be gleeful or worried because that means that someone's about to get murdered. And yeah, we see the brutal murder of the mom right in front of the kid. So making us care about the relationship was a cheap tactic to make the slasher kill hit harder. And he comes to... Do you see what he time travels with in the tub? Yes, it's ice! Don't forget your shrink apartment. I mean, she's already tiny. I get to make jokes like that. I'm short too. That's the guy? That's the psychic? Did you want a middle-aged female Roma with a crystal ball? What an awkwardly written line to establish that some of the cops don't like the psychic thing. Just have him say, I still don't like the idea of working with a psychic. Who did you think it was? Gestapo. It's not that kind of time travel movie. And the siblings argue about talking about the fire. He's kind of a hypocrite telling her to get therapy, but he doesn't want to talk about this traumatic event for both of them. Wow, he hates that talk so much, he's heading out at the risk of actually getting the number of the niece of the landlord. You act like you don't know what I'm talking about. I know, but the audience doesn't. Can I get a clean glass? This one's dirty. Fuck you, man. It's the cleanest one I got. And yeah, she reveals she wants his psychic ability to clear Lonnie's name. I thought Lonnie was very convincing in the various... Yeah. Let's see. The... Um, I wanted to note... Right, here we are, yeah. Just really quickly gonna add something to my notes. But yeah, the, the, and I, I like the several turns in the scene. Why couldn't more of the movie have been like that? That was legitimate. Like, thinking back to it, yeah, I was super engaged at that point. Like, you know, he goes to, and, and Lonnie, like, you know, at first you don't quite know what's going on with Lonnie. And the first thing Lonnie says to him is, are you here to laugh at me? And, you know, at first, like, the, you know, when, when I heard him say that, I was thinking, you know, I wasn't entirely sure if he actually recognized Sam or not, but, you know, yeah, basically, like, let's see, I was thinking something along the lines of, he must be so sure that no one still has any sympathy or empathy for him that he can't imagine anything else. And then he, you know, he says that Sam did it you know, out of jealousy, since he, you know, that, so, so basically the idea is that Lonnie thinks that Sam caught the, you know, spotted the two of them together, waited for Lonnie to leave, and then killed, I think her name was Rebecca, but we meet, her, we meet her sister, and then they talk about Rebecca, yeah, I think, you know, and and made it look like it was Lonnie, and now he's here to gloat, you know, now that it can't, 
you know, he figures, ah, uh, you know, it's too late for Lonnie to do anything. So, you know, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. And yeah, man, why couldn't more of the movie have been like that? They were really on to something interesting there. Like, obviously not every single scene should be exactly like that, but have, like, I mean, it does have other twists, but that was one where I really, like, ah, what's the word? It, it was... The, the, you know, I, I thought there might be a chance that Lonnie could be set free. And, you know, later, th that is what actually happens. You know, Lonnie does get his freedom. And let's see. Then there was the... Uh, yeah, I actually, thinking about it, I guess it's because... I think the movie actually lost something when it started being about a serial killer. I liked when it was one murder and we see the the effect that it had, you know, one guy's in jail for a you know, for a murder he didn't commit and the the sister and boyfriend are both really upset even all these years later, you know, and it brings them no peace to know that someone is going to die for the, the crime. They're both convinced of his innocence. But then it starts being about a serial killer, and it's just, you know, a lot of people have died, and he goes around trying to find some of the different people. I, maybe, I just, like, I don't know exactly how, but I completely lost, like, th when he comes back and is told there is now a serial killer, I don't even remember what what did they s was it the sedan killer i'm going to go with sedan killer and yeah like he's told oh you know he killed eight people we, you know we saw two people be killed but he killed six other people wait was that before vicky is vicky in addition to the eight i mean anita why did they say eight people died and we only know about four of them? Or wait, was was Goldman supposed to be one of them? No, no, because they said he killed eight women. I, I just, I don't get why they would specifically, because they say it several times, this guy killed eight people, but, or eight women, but we only ever know about four of them because Jenna wasn't one of them. And those are the only four prominent women in the movie. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. But yeah, so Sam in the past trying to discover the murderer is the first bit of tension. 25 minutes into the movie, almost a third of the way. But the tension is decent. And I like the shot where, you know, the sister's in the car and we see a shape behind her. And Sam finds Rebecca dead in the bed. At first I was like, there's no way the sheets are so... Like, you know, they'd be way more messed up if he, if, if the killer cut her, you know, I think in the entire torso open, you know, but maybe she killed her somewhere else and then put the body in the bed to buy herself time for the car killing, you know, so I can, I can, I'm okay with that. You know, I've seen worse stuff and it was a decent reveal, you know, I, I, and I did actually... Like, of course he thinks that it's better for her to stay in the car. He thinks that he's dealing with a normal killer. He doesn't know that the killer can time travel too, you know. So, yeah, he goes up there. He's he's trying to figure out, is the killer already in here? You know, is it possible that I can get here before the, the killer actually... Actually, yeah, I think he was fairly certain of that, come to think of it. Anyway, whatever. He goes up there, and he thinks, you know, oh, is she asleep? You know, should I wake her up? Kind of thing. And then he, you know, removes the the sheets, which is a tiny bit creepy, but it's, you know, it's there for the service of the 
the reveal, so they sacrificed, the, you know, it's not a movie that has a particularly high opinion of women, uh, you know, so, yeah, they're either there to look sexy or there to be killed. And, yeah, like I said, movie's gross, man. And the, the, yeah, once again, I don't mind sex in movies, I don't mind violence in movies, I do think we should, you know, that's one thing, like, say what you will, you don't have to love 1982's The Thing, but point me to someone who dies in that movie that you didn't know or care about at all. Now, you know, I would be very surprised if you could convince me that I would, that I would also feel that way about one of the, but, you know, yeah, feel free, go to the comments. I, I'm happy to debate that movie. So, yeah, the, the you know, you see the, the sister in the car, and we see this out-of-focus shape behind her, and, you know, then we, yeah, we see her kill the, the and, yeah. And he wakes up, things are very different, he's a suspect. Lonnie, as a lawyer, is very convincing, too. Wait, he blames Sam for himself drunk driving? You could have gotten a taxi, too. Like, I... I you know, we, we went for a drink, and with you, one drink turns into 20, and you got a taxi. You couldn't get a taxi, too? Like, I guess maybe they lived too far apart to split... To, for it to make sense to split one, but, like, you're not... You can't blame someone else for you making the bad decision to to drive drunk. I, f I feel like that's that's trying to recapture some of that magic from the first one, where it's like, oh, when Evan did this, this happened, you know, because, like, yeah, I'm in the section where I'm spoiling all three movies. Let me think of a good example. What was that noise? Uh, anyway, so in the first movie... There was the, let's see, ah, I know I can think of a good example. He, yeah, yeah, you know, he goes back to his childhood and he tells the neighbors, uh, yeah, the neighbor, the neighbor man, treat your daughter, you know, never touch your daughter again. But give your son some discipline. He's messed up, you know. Goes back to the, the present, and Kaylee tells him, My father never touched me. He, it's like he saved it all for my brother, you know. And it's like, oh no, you know. Because, like, Evan didn't mean to do a bad thing. But he did a bad, bad thing. And, yeah, you know, it feels like that... But it's the, it's the only thing in the movie, isn't it? Like, other than that, he's just, like, he travels back in time. He talks to a woman, and that woman ends up dead. Or in the case of Anita, ends up surviving. Yeah, a anyway. I, I really didn't think it made any sense. And I feel like Evan's time travel, like, the things he would try to do... I'm not going to claim that it made perfect sense for him to stand in front of the exploding, you know, ah, mailbox, but it's like, he wasn't, like, he runs out, I think, I think he was going to try to rush the, the mother and child away, but then he sees, I, I do not recall his name, ah, uh, I feel bad, he's, he, all, three versions of all all three actors do a great job but but yeah the the you know the bully kid the neighbor's son you know he's the one who rushes the the mother and, and child away and basically evan is so surprised that he ends up standing in front of the the bird uh, yeah ah uh, mailbox the mailbox and yeah, you know, it always made some sense. Anyway, so yeah, the real plot kicks in around a third of the way through. Time travel to uncover a serial killer.
I need a Barnes. Well, you can't have one. They're all out of Barnes. G go hit up the Amish. Maybe they can help. Let's see. At first, it seemed like the time travel where he finds the couple role-playing rape. It, you know, at first I thought it was padding. Didn't really accomplish anything, but when he goes back to the present, Anita is still alive, and now he has to figure out why. So the, the overall, it wasn't padding to have the scene there. There was no way. There was no reason for it to go on for as long as it did. If you want to establish that, like, you know, Sam thought he was going to witness a murder, and instead it turns out to be a couple role-playing, you can do that very quickly. You don't have to, like, there are two or three minutes of, like, the, the, you know, the, the man, like, trying to force himself on her, the woman and, like, him threatening her and all these things before finally he stops and says, I'm not okay with this emotionally, psychologically, you know. You could have had that be, like, you could have had that happen almost immediately. I hate to say it because it's so messed up, but I can only really imagine it's there for the people in the audience who get off on that sort of thing, who want to see this, you know, seeming rape thing. Yeah, I... I don't think there's anything wrong with the kink. As long, you know, she even mentions, I didn't say the safe word. I have no problem with the, you know, if these were, if these two characters were real life people, I would defend their right to do this. It's, they're in their own bedroom. They're talking through it. You know, it's not like someone is actually getting hurt. He is uncomfortable with how it makes him feel. I forget, did she end up kind of accepting that? I forget, but, you know, yeah. I really, I, I don't have a problem with that entire, yeah. It, but it's hard for me to not feel like they're trying to, like, ah. I don't know, have I made myself clear? Am I... There's nothing wrong with two or more, you know, whatever, people getting together and, you know, communicating about it and then living out a fantasy like that. But if there's, like, some person sitting at home watching this movie by themselves and getting off on that and, you know, maybe they're gonna like, try to force something like that on a woman, you know, that's wrong. You have to, you have to have the conversation first. It's not okay to push something, you know, yeah, yeah, I have made my point. It's okay, I know her. Oh, honey, you changed pepper spray. Oh, this one's got, like, a lemony after, to oh, wow. I bet you saved a lot of money on that. Good call. And, yeah, we see Anita is alive. And, you know, by the end of the movie, we realize that's because Sam traveled without Jenna. If she knew he traveled, she would, too, to kill Anita. That's why she's still alive. Well, wait a second. Does... Does that hold up? Because Sam didn't actually, like, stop the person who was going to hurt her. Like, the, the only thing that actually changed was that she knew him as... Oh, right, because they no longer dated. I forgot. Yeah, that... Okay, yeah. She went back, she traveled back in time to before they dated, and, yeah. And, I feel like Sam is written to freak out too frequently in this movie, but the actor does a good job with it. I do think him freaking out after, 
let's see. Yeah, you know, Jenna says maybe he's the one who started the fire. That makes sense. And I guess the common thing is that he freaks out when she talks about the fire, asks him to get into detail about it because of the trauma. But yeah, you know, the, the let's see. I think the freak out when she, you know, when, when he mentions you should see your shrink, and then she's like, you know, talked about the 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 night, you know, the the house fire, and the, you know, I think they needed to have him freak out less, like turn it down by two thirds, maybe at least one third. Then I'm okay with it. But as it is, he just comes off as kind of histrionic, and you just you almost kind of wonder how does this guy like? I, I get he he doesn't quite have a normal life. But how does he leave his apartment and, like, you know, he just, he comes across as someone that wouldn't be able to, you know, she's the one who doesn't leave the house. How can he, you know, leave the house? So, yeah, they pushed it too far. And Sam is a suspect in Vicky's murder. That's another thing. The... That was an absolutely ridiculous sex scene. Like, okay, we get it. You're trying desperately. Like, obviously, the idea is teenage boys watch the movie and tell each other, you gotta watch this movie. You gotta go to Blockbuster and pay them money so you can watch this sex scene. You know, because in 2009, you couldn't just go online and find that. You know, so, yeah, the the... It was absolutely ridiculous, and I I feel bad for the actress because she is trying in the other scenes that you know she like she doesn't have a huge amount of different ah what's the word different 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 personalities that she has to but she does have like two. And I thought she was convincing, but, you know, clearly she was just there for the, yeah, for the allure factor. I don't actually know anything else about her career. I hope she got a proper chance. Like, you know, some of the most, some, some of the best young actresses were objectified at, at first. Now, so yeah. We find out that Sam is a suspect in Vicky's murder, and the black cop covers the window, and like, like it's it's like a chokehold on Sam, and and Sam is like, never choke the throat like that. The victim can't respond verbally. Ah, my Joker's way out of. I I haven't been practicing. And Sam gets the information about the factory, gets off because of Jen. Lawyer, I'm not sure why he doesn't time travel with her. She's willing. He's been told he needs someone to look after him when he jumps. And that's been proven. I mean, the only thing I can think of is, you know, the screenwriter needed them to jump separately. Otherwise, these scenes would go differently. And, yeah, I... You gotta explain it for the... Like... We never see Jenna be upset about his time travel. As, as like she never says that she doesn't want to help him, for example. I realize I, I didn't even mention Goldberg. I like the character. I really appreciate it that we have like a mentor who actually, you know, I, I know some people were like, ah, oh, you gotta you gotta tell us about his background. I mean I feel like it's just the the you know, he he has some knowledge about it. We we really just need someone we need someone to to be there to compel Sam don't try to change things. Because, you know, we already if we've been watching these movies, we've seen twice now, two entire movies, it doesn't go well. You know, I I feel like if you've watched the entire first movie, especially if you watch the director's cut, and by the end you're still like is it possible, is it possible to time travel and change just one thing and make lives work? You didn't understand the movie at all because it goes out of its way to, like, yeah. Anyway, 
the the you know Evan's father tried to talk him out of it and it didn't work so you know they needed a mentor character you know what if it had been a TV show that mentor character could have been fleshed out over a number of episodes I am starting to wonder if maybe this started out as a TV pilot and someone was like we'll never sell it as a TV pilot but if we add some sex and gore, we can sell it as a direct video you know, yeah, anyway. And he comes back from the factory, and he's at Jenna's place now, and she's a lot more well-adjusted. I'm not even sure why he went back to the present from that trip. Like, nothing really happened. Like, if I understand correctly, like, the... In in the first movie, for you to travel through time, some, you basically have to change at least one really big thing, you know. It also, it, it's frequently also that something really shocking happens to Evan or to one of the, you know, yeah, one of the neighbor kids, basically. And the, the... Yeah, you know, in in the, like he went to the factory, find some blood trails, and it, someone wrote in blood, "Welcome home," and then he goes back, and I'm like, nothing happened. Nothing, nothing happened that would make him wake up, and not. His life changed for the better, didn't it? Because he's back at Jenna's place. He was waking up on the. Latino's couch and first the the it was like a renting situation and then the Latino was angry because he wasn't paying rent but now he he's at Jenna's place so things change for the better for some reason I have no idea the yeah and and he has you know the one phone call why did he call the black cop rather than Jenna. She's the one who got him free last time. He can talk to the black cop after leaving prison. I'm also not 100% sure why they even arrested... Like, okay, so if I... They arrested him because he was near the factory, right? And people were getting killed inside the factory, but it was... It was circumstantial, just like it was the other time when Jenna's lawyer got him off. So, I don't understand. Yeah. And, you know, we get the... the I don't... The the thing with, you know, he asked, what, it, what was the first thing my wife said to me? You know, and he traveled back in time and heard, you know, are you MC Hammer? And... and, and kid is standing there and it's just like it's such a silly little yeah how is that in the same movie as the several minutes of sex the several minutes of of rape play and all of the gore like it, it's completely yeah anyway and okay so if i understand um, Sam, th when Sam sees the white flower, he thinks that Goldman is the serial killer and only becomes convinced that he's not when he sees that Goldman is missing and someone broke into his place. Actually, now that I think about it, I'm not even sure that did convince him. He's just like, okay, I guess I can't find him now, but yeah. If Goldman was the serial killer, why... Like, that just raises so many questions. I'm really glad that didn't turn out to be the case, because that really... Anyway, yeah. So, he accidentally smells the white flower and is falling asleep. He looks like me watching Butterfly Effect, too. I've explained it to you a zillion times. It's getting frustrating. See, what you need to do, Jenna, is make a tape for him to watch each time. Then people will mistake a horror film ending for a romantic gesture. 
seriously, they did at least apparently later make a version of that that was a straight out a straight up horror movie. Like I, yeah. Anyway, none of them were ladies. I went through the Tom Jones lyrics and they failed that test. I would have had a family, a life. So this isn't about the murdered women anymore? Was it ever? It was legitimately fun seeing Rachel Miner play a complete lunatic at the end. I am, I am a, I'm such a mark for that kind of thing, but I love when a story, a movie about a killer, one or more killers, ending with like this you know, over-the-top performance of, like, you know, she even, like, she says, oh, it's like Scooby-Doo. I would have gotten away with it if it weren't for those men. Wow. I I really, really want to see her in more stuff. I, I think this is the first thing I've seen her in at all. But, yeah, I'm going to have to. That's, that was amazing. That was so much fun to see. Uh, I'm debating mentally if I want to do some impersonations. Yeah, so, okay. The following, you know, if you know, you know. If not, I'm not spoiling anything. You hit me with the phone, dick! My mom and daddy are so mad at me! Yeah, that might, that might be my favorite. Sam, are you jumping? You can just do that without ice, drugs, nothing? I just, I, I... And Goldberg specifically said, if you travel back to the same point twice, it will fry your brain, which is how it explains that he's not getting the brain hemorrhages that e Evan was getting, you know. Evan did get them without jumping to the same, you know, he, he got them from just jumping in general. But these are two different movies. This movie's allowed to change the rules. I don't think it makes a single reference to the first two movies at all. So it's allowed. The fact that the title, you know, I mean, the, the, let's see. Yeah, as a, as a quick comparison, you know, Technically, the 1982 The Thing is supposed to be a remake of the 1950 yeah, 50-something. I've seen it. Not my favorite of the of the 1950s. You know, I, I'm I'm a I'm a pretty big fan of the 1950s sci-fi schlock. Uh, I, I yeah, I think they're really really entertaining to watch. But yeah. You know, but the aliens in these movies are completely different from each other, you know. And the 1986 The Fly is technically a remake of the 1960-something... Was it just 1960 straight? With, with I want to say, Vincent Price was in that. Huge fan of his as well, R.I.P. We lost a legend in him, but the the way that the experiment goes wrong... You know, the again, hugely different. So it's allowed. You can you can do that. It. I would be frustrated if this was. Let, let's say that this was like Evan's cousin or something. Then I'd be like, okay, you you really should follow the rules. Let's see. But but yeah, the. Okay, so I guess the idea is. The ice for his body, is better than jumping without ice. But sometimes, let's see. I mean, I, I just feel like there should be some kind of consequence. Because, like, there at the end, he, he makes the longest time jump that he does at all. You know, he jumps all the way back to their, their teenage years. And, yeah, there's just no consequence for him not using ice or drugs or anything. So, yeah. I mean, the other times he made the effort, like he tied a string around his finger so he could turn off the, the light switch without someone else being in the room and the whole thing. And then there at the end, he can just do it without just, yeah. 
I thought it was legitimately moving the the early times in the you know the yeah, let's see when he actually I guess it's near the end anyway when he tells Jenna before I tr you know originally you died you burned to death in the house we buried you I mourned you and then later I traveled back and rescued you you know I thought that was legitimately moving and then of course they have to turn it into this creepy thing of like incest and just yeah the the ah there was something I wanted to I mean yeah basically the movie almost none of the positive feelings that it ever engenders are treated as just you know this is something to be happy about you know which again like at the end of the day I will 100% grant there's an absurd amount of tragedy in the original Butterfly Effect movie, but there are also, like, yeah, whether whether you watch the theatrical cut or the director's cut, you do get, you know, there's a happy ending there at the end. So, I, I just feel like that movie works really, you know, the lead has to work extremely hard for the happy ending and eventually has to give up his own happy ending so that his friends can have one. But I didn't feel like the movie was just, like, being manipulative when it was working toward, like, you see that, you know, he and Evan and Kaylee, you know, they fall in love and that's not treated as, like, you see that it angers her brother but it is also treated as, you know, no, they, they love each other and they want to be together. And he travels on time and they get to be together and they're really happy until, you know, the consequences come around. And yeah, in this movie, I just, it, like, the ending almost feels like a troll. It's like, just, yeah. Now, let's see. I, I think I said anything about... I mean, psychologically, I can buy that the fact that he traveled in time to save her life and this thing of, like, she, you know, they, they all they have is each other. They lost their parents in that fire. That meant that she fell in love with him. Yeah. And yeah, so the final time jump, he gets a happy life with the girl the audience barely knows anything about because this isn't about her happiness. It's about Sam's. He gets her as a prize for killing his sister. And daughter Jenna burns her doll with a creepy look on her face because if there's anything, you know, if there's one thing that you have to have in a sequel to The Butterfly Effect, it's a child and a kind of creepy thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I legitimately don't even, like, okay, so she's going to want to burn people, I guess, is, is, serious. you know what, that kid, that was a pretty decent performance, I don't know what the director told her to get that face out of her, but that was creepy, that was legitimately creepy, I don't think it was written smartly, but I don't, like, okay, you know, 2009, by now she's an adult. But, like, if I, you know, if in 2009 I watched this and then, like, I passed her on the street, I would probably take a couple of steps away from her, you know, and it wouldn't be because of COVID, because that wasn't around back then. But, yeah. Did Rebecca have a line in the, she, she might have said something there in the final scene. I don't know what her personality is. All I know about her is that she apparently cheated on Sam with Lonnie, but she was, like, in love with both of them or something like that, you know, because, I don't know, I guess that's all this movie thinks is important for a woman who, he sh who she has slept with who killed her. I think that's the definition of creepy, because that's that's literally all that the movie tells her, tells us about her. That there's just, yeah, I think the sister was probably also there at the end, but that was probably, 
Well, okay, actually, I guess, because they were celebrating something, so the girlfriend and the girlfriend's sister, you know, since they're, they're peers anyway, they might even have gone to school together, which, again, I have to theorize, because the movie's not telling us. Actually, hold on, come to think of it, I think it might have told us that they were school... A anyway, the... Yeah, I really didn't think the ending was... Yeah. Again, I think the happy ending in the first one worked, especially because it's a self-sacrificial happy ending. Everyone except Evan gets a happy ending. No, literally, like even his mother gets to have children that aren't, you know, because the the Evan was the one child who didn't kill him. You know, again, I'm going off the director's cut. I realized if you only watch the theatrical, you have you don't know what I'm talking about there. But ah, uh, yeah. Really briefly, there's a scene in the director's cut where the mother explains to Evan that she had, she got pregnant from Evan's father three times, but the first two died in the womb, and by the end of the movie, he is traveling back to when she was pregnant with him, and he's tying the, the umbilical cord around his neck. And the implication, the heavy implication is that Every single time she has a son, uh, a child, with this man, with Evan's father, whose name I am afraid I do not recall right now. Every time that kid developed these time-traveling powers, every single time they realized, you know, they ruin other people's lives by traveling time, which I still take issue with because it's not really Evan who's doing something wrong, it's the the father of the neighbor kids anyway i talked about that in my video on that so anyway the yes so the movie ends with him tr him killing himself like that as well and she doesn't have more kids from this this one man she marries someone else and that the the kids are not going to develop time travel powers and the movie basically says everyone's better off for never knowing Evan at all, which is really messed up, considering that he really, like, I mean, it is it is this very bleak thing of the more you try to help people, the more you hurt them. And I wish that the movie would just really hold the father, the, the neighbor kid father accountable, because it is him doing these awful, awful things. And, like, at the end of the movie, even Director Scott, he's not dead. Like, he could go and molest some other kid, beat some other kid, to the point where... Anyway, yeah. That's probably my biggest problem with the first movie. And that brings us to notes taken before watching. And, yeah, so let's see... I do think that this movie does get a little bit out of being, you know, a sequel. I'm I'm going to put that a little bit in quotes because it really is, like, all it takes is the, the key concept. You know, like, if you go off the theatrical cut of the first movie, then Evan didn't die. And he and Kaylee might even end up together. That's implied by the ending. But the... Let's see. And the the second guy... Because, the yeah, the second movie heavily implied that the kid was going to develop powers as well. But that kid is not Sam. Ah, uh, let me... I'm, I'm almost 100% certain that there's some kind of thing confirming that. So I'm going to look up the second one. And, let's see. Yeah, so the, let's see, Nick. Yeah, in the second movie, the baby at the end is named Nick. So, you know, why, why would he change his name to Sam? The intentionally they made sure that this isn't 
tied to the second movie. Let's see. And I think also, I mean, I don't think any of these, do any of the movies really spell out this is taking place in this and this year? I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but certainly the, both of the, all three of the movies appear to be set in the year they came out because there's no futuristic technology. So there's no way that the third movie takes place. What would that be, like 20 years after the second? Yeah. Now, the... Let's see. Yeah, so... And yeah, so quoting fellow critics, the Butterfly Effect 3 is more careless than ever when it comes to continuity and presumes that any audience that is already willing to accept time travel will blindly buy into its many plot contrivances. While this is to be expected in a film of its type, the main problem is that there are no real clues left anywhere in time that help to identify the killer. The entire build has only been a cheap, in a setup for the cheap and unforgivable twist in the end. And yeah, it's absolutely true. And I, I didn't want to give that away in the review itself, because, you know, that would mean that people who were watching it for the first time would, like, be like, okay, well, I guess I don't, there's no reason to bother looking for clues, you know. And it's true that anyone who does look carefully for clues and is that frustrated, that's also a disappointment, but. You know, yeah, I, I try not to spoil things, you know, and I would add, you know, not every slasher movie of a mystery needs to provide clues, but even some of the more average ones do, you know, again, I don't think the Friday the 13th movies are amazing, but the ones that hint at like, you know, the, if you, if you're watching a Friday the 13th movie and you don't know going in who is the, yeah, who is the killer, there are clues, you know, I, Thing an argument could be made that there, you know, some of the clues are a little too like, wait, well, that, that was a clue, but there's something, you know, and yeah. And and again, I do think it's okay to make a slasher movie and have it be a mystery and not provide clues, but like. Part of the movie is a police procedural, and there aren't clues. Like, that's... Like, come on, man. And, yeah, back to quoting fellow critics. They've lost the concept. Not that I'm surprised, but still. Even though it might have been too obvious if he had been the killer himself, it would have still been better. And the happy ending is just messing it up more. The whole idea is that you can't make everything all right, at least not if you are the one jumping. And no, I don't buy the cliffhanger at all. Why make the sequel? Why? The concept is... Uh, I'm sorry, it was thrilling. And the first movie had... Although weak Matrix vibes. Okay. Let's see. Oh, Pontiac Serial Killer. That was the name. Of it. Yeah. And. Yeah. Since he never does come face to face with the killer in his time travels, and since time traveling makes him act crazy, we wonder if perhaps he really is the killer. I do think that would have been an interesting twist, and that would have gone with this thing of, like, at the end of the day, you know, yeah, again, the first two movies are about the lead can time travel, but when he does, you know, some things... Yeah, things get worse for the people he cares about. And the, the yeah, you know, that's essentially not what this movie is about. This movie is about that he, I mean, basically, if he hadn't traveled back and saved his sister, things would be better off. And when he, you know, yeah, the, the ah, what was the other thing? 
Um, yeah, you know, this is not a movie that's about if you yourself travel in time, you will make things worse for them. You know, it's about if you have an incestuous, you know, of, of, if you have a sibling who's who has incestuous, you know, feelings for you, and um, yeah, you know the then she's going, you know, uh, yeah, then she's going to travel back in time and kill people. You know, it, and that's fine. Like, I don't mind that it, again, like, it's enough with the first movie. I don't think we needed a sequel to be the, like, to deliver the same message. But it does just feel like... I guess maybe the the maybe at some point it was himself and then they felt like it was too obvious. Yeah. The you know the the sister twist twi the twisted sister twist really does not make any it you know th thematically it completely just yeah. But they wanted a slasher with time travel, and so, yeah. Yeah, that would actually, yeah. Maybe, let's see, could it be? You know what would have been cool? If traveling back in time did create another one of him, because he's not jumping into his younger body, he's creating a new one and putting that body where he wants to travel to. And that person, the, the duplicate of him, becomes a serial killer because he doesn't fit in with the rest of, you know, he's always slightly askew, you know, he's not supposed to be there kind of thing. So that him traveling in time did cause it because as it is, like, there was already a killer. I, it, actually, yeah, I guess because he traveled in time to save his sister, but... Yeah, the okay, the thing is that in the other movies we found out pretty quickly that he ruined things by trying to make things better for a person. You know, he uh, let's see. Yeah, he he tells the 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 neighbor not to touch his own daughter, but to discipline his son. That turns out bad. He talks up the other neighbor boy so you know you're you're going to you're going to make things better today and he instead he stabs the other neighbor boy you know each of these like he it it's very clear that he like i actually yeah i guess come to think of it no actually wait yeah it's only revealed late in the movie that he traveled back in time to save her isn't it because at first they thought that we're supposed to think that that wasn't time travel, that he just managed to save her there. I think, yeah, okay, fair enough, that works better than I thought it did. Let's see. When, yeah, back to quote, quoting fellow critics. When a movie has a very detailed depiction of a woman sobbing and shrieking as her entails get sawed to bits, while heavy metal blares as if it were the most badass thing since steroid abuse. That's fucking creepy. And it's the woman there was a graphic sex scene with. Borderline softcore porn scene with. So the movie is punishing her for the sex. And, you know, the audience is supposed to feel like, oh, we, you know, we desired that woman and now she's dying brutally. And it's just, yeah, it's really, really gross, man. And, yeah, couldn't feel great. Why did the parents survive when the sister died? It, uh, let's see. Yeah, when, uh, it looks like the parents should have been able to survive the first time. You know, he, he goes, whether he goes in to block the door so she dies or open the door so she can get out, she can get out, like, as long as he goes to save the parents first, that works, you know, he can save the parents, so it's just, yeah. 
there are two, uh, let's see. Yeah, and, and some people take issue with the fact that there are two people jumping, saying, you know, that should create two completely different parallel worlds. Uh, let's see. No, yeah, whatever, you know, creating parallel and... Let's see. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a big problem, but it does... Yeah, so... Basically, you know, at first I was, you know, before watching it, I was wondering, is it that every time Sam travels, she does as well, like, automatically? But no, because there are times where she's she doesn't travel back in time. She doesn't, you know, attack a person because he's traveling without her knowing. So basically, when they travel, you know, when she covers for him traveling, you know, she, she says, oh, you know, I need to watch your body so nothing bad happens. You know, as soon as he's traveled, she travels as well, and travels so that she can kill the person, and yeah. But he never, like, there's never a time where he can't... Oh, is that why he can't find her when he goes to... And and falls asleep there at the end, from sniffing the, the flower? Is that supposed to be her traveling in time? But then he travels in time, and then she's there. Yeah, she already traveled in time to the and went to the factory to kill someone, and then he showed up. Yeah, it's just like, and and the, I mean, at the end of the day, it's you know the, there aren't really any clues uncovered by the time traveling. But if you stop to think, wait, if they're siblings, does that mean that both of them can time travel? then you've pretty much figured out, oh, she time travels to kill someone, and then, you know, you know who else could it be? Because the, the, yeah, because when the, ah, let's see. Yeah, when he travels in time to find Rebecca and, you know, finds her in the bed and she's been cut up, then we see that the killer was already waiting for the sister in the car, that would only make sense if she were traveling in time. Why would she, like, what, she was just, like, hiding out in some bushes before? Yeah, she must actually, wait. How did she get in the car? Did she sneak into the car in, like, the minute or two that the two of them were arguing over whether or not she should get back into the car? You know, Sam and the sister? Because that didn't take... Like, she left the car, and they talked briefly. Wow. She is incredibly sneaky, then. And... Let's see. So, yeah. You know, the... the You know, the end is... Sam is rewarded for allowing the brutal death of a then-innocent teen girl. I guess we know this movie's answer to the would you travel back in time and kill Hitler question. I think it should have been a dark ending, you know, like maybe he gets the death penalty because people realize it's his fault that Jenna is dead, but it also means he stopped the serial killer, something like that, you know. Again, say what you will about the, you don't have to love the first movie, and you definitely don't have to love the second, but they did understand that it does, like, it, it hits a certain way when a character gives up their own happiness for the happiness of people they care about, you know, and just, yeah, and, and then with this, it's like, I guess he, yeah, yeah, he does, I mean, he doesn't even seem upset anymore, so now that he knows that, okay, fair enough, I can understand, he knows that she's going to kill people, er, right, he loses sympathy for her when he realizes that she has killed people, he no longer Although it's still, like, shouldn't it still be traumatic? And, like, again, why does she need to die, though? I get that, like, she needs to not be a serial killer, but couldn't it just be, like... Actually, you know what? I think it would have been kind of cool if, like, the... the Let's see. Yeah, he, he lets her... Well, actually, yeah, wait. If she survives and the parents survive... Ah, uh, wait. 
No, yeah, because it's the time travel that's the problem. Anyway, yeah. Like, if she, if, if he time traveled and saved the parents and Jenna, and then he, like, tried to, to influence her so that she doesn't, either doesn't serial kill or only serial kills bad people, and I've just invented gender flip Dexter. You're welcome. Yeah, so the first movie is a teen-oriented movie all about the lead traveling through times, saving lives, improving lives. The second one doesn't really add anything to that. I guess it's a logical, if not emotionally resonant, endpoint to make this third movie and second sequel a serial killer movie where the time traveler keeps saving different people and they keep ending up dead since slashers are popular with teens. I guess this is the movie that Scream 4 was referencing with that part, like how Jason X is the slasher in space that they reference. No, I do not recall which of the stab movies has a time has time travel and which of them is in space, but I'm pretty sure both of those do occur in the you know, in my defense, I watched that movie like actually it, yeah, I watched it more than once, but the last time I watched it was years ago. I do really appreciate we can have a butterfly effect movie where the protagonist who can time travel is trying to avoid changing the past after we've had two movies with a protagonist who thinks he can fix everything so keeps traveling into the past to try. I think that kind of thing only works once. Don't make more than one movie like that in a series. The first butterfly effect was not the first to do this but I've seen some of the others and it's definitely different enough from them that it was worth making. Come to think of it, I guess the the Guy Pierce, the time machine, was that made because of the the butterfly effect doing well? I, I gotta check if the, the time machine... Oh, never mind, must have been the other way around. The time machine is from 2002, and butterfly effect is from 2004. But yeah, you know, that movie's fine, you know. I, like, I as far as I understand it takes a lot of stuff from the book so that's nice at least but yeah I just I I do not in any way shape form or fashion find it remotely as emotionally resonant as the first butterfly effect movie is but yeah so Sam isn't trying to change the past only observe it and that you know he does Is it a bad sign that I'm actually not 100% certain if he was trying to... I guess he wasn't actually trying to... Pre like, after a while, he stopped trying to prevent the killings of the first several of the women. He just wanted the killer to be stopped from... You know, he didn't want the killer to kill all eight women, or he wanted to catch the killer in the present day, but he didn't want to stop... The kill yeah I think I think the idea was that he didn't actually yeah anyway but yes you know the past does get changed even though he is trying not to change it so it's a different dynamic it actually sounds like an idea I had when realizing how similar part two is to part one so I am just briefly gonna get yeah I like to sometimes try to write a better movie in these videos. My idea for how to make a sequel, not a remake, to the original movie and add something to make it different, interesting, in a new way from the first one would be to have more than one person capable of traveling. Both can travel on their own. Early on, both of them agree on how to travel. They travel together. They agree on how to fix things. Maybe they sometimes both have something to do at the same time for some of it to work out best. Maybe you're going to have like a short montage where they make everything better and they're just incredible at it. Think the montage from Groundhog Day where he's just speed running only then suddenly there's some kind of plot development that makes them realize that every time they travel, there's a terrible cost. Sure, they might get something out of it. They might even save something for some other people, but something terrible happens. Maybe a loved one dies. Let's see. You know, monkey's paw rules and... While one of them, Joe, is horrified and says they can never travel again, the other one, Jack, shakes his head. He's too happy with all he's getting out of 
the, the time travel. He travels again. Now Joe has to figure out where Jack traveled to so he can intercept him, and he has to make the terrible choice to do something bad to stave off something worse, the trolley problem. And as the movie closes, the chilling realization of what exactly the horrible thing happened, and maybe Jack doesn't die. Maybe he has to live in this horrible new reality. Maybe everybody hates him for what they saw him do, and he and the audience are the only ones to know that he prevented it from being even more terrible. Or you can make it a villain origin story. But yeah, in The Butterfly Effect 2, Nick is just kind of an asshole. Let's see. You know, yeah, you can make a movie where the guy who can time travel is an absolute monster, like do a Game of Thrones Breaking Bad kind of thing, where we gradually see him gaining more and more power, doing increasingly unethical, monstrous things. You don't even have to give it an ending where he stopped. You could just let it end on a downer, which, again, would fit with the first one. So, yeah. Jenna has to set up a bear trap, presumably specifically in case someone, a, a person comes around. I'm definitely certain that she is not you know, we do not see her using a reverse bear trap, so she is not hunting the elusive reverse bear. And, let's see. Yeah, so the first movie has a strong first successful time travel trip that changed everything scene. When Evan wakes up, he's still at the college, but in a different part, with a girl in his bed he thought was dead, and he then walks down the hallway of the sorority with music, sound design, characters that underline how different this is from his old life. The second movie does not have a scene as well done. I guess the part where he walks out of his new office and or into his new home is supposed to be it. It's nowhere near as effective. And yeah, this movie doesn't really have... Yeah, I guess the ending is the only scene like that in this entire movie. Let's see. Yeah. And, and to be fair, like, that last one, you know, oh, Rebecca's alive. Her sister, whose name I don't remember, is alive. Yeah. So, let's see. Yeah, so in the first two, the lead can only travel in time. He moves his consciousness into his younger body. And, you know, it, it's always somewhere that his younger body was already present for. He doesn't, like, go somewhere hugely different. But it seems like in this, he can transport his body as well. Otherwise, how could he be at the scene of the crime over and over different crimes? And, yeah, you know, I get that he controls where to go by using the information in the case file. You know, he knows where the murder took place and, you know, when and, and that kind of thing. But, yeah, it's like... Okay, let's hypothetically say that... Originally, you know, like, supposedly he was nowhere near Rebecca when she was murdered the first time. Lonnie was. That was why he was the suspect. And later, you know, yeah. So, let's say that there's two miles, hypothetically, between Sam's house and Rebecca's house. And Sam was at home when Rebecca was murdered, and she was murdered in her home. So, when he travels in time, he also moves his body the two miles. Does that mean that when he wakes up in the present, his body would have to move those two miles back? Or does he just, does he just jump automatically, immediately into... Like, there's something interesting there. You could, you could explore that. Like, have someone say, dude, what happened to you? You were, like, right there, and suddenly you disappeared? Like, like a Jumanji, you know, with, like, you know, one kid disappears and the other kid, like, sees the disappearance and, like, has to go to therapy to, to deal with the trauma of it, you know. There's something so interesting there, and, yeah, the movie doesn't explore it at all. Like, for all the scenes this movie has of people talking... There's so many things that they could have talked about that they don't. And let's see. Yeah, so I'm just briefly going to, you know, I already mentioned there was some homophobia in the dialogue. You know, in this, it's when Vicky, the bartender, leaves. And I honestly, at first, I thought that she was sympathetic to it because, like, the, the studies show, you know, basically... Every man will at some point 
be impotent, you know, and it is in fact usually psychological. So what we're seeing in the movie is in fact like, I mean, it's it's a little weird that he agreed to have sex with her at all, but the you know they wanted a sex scene in the movie. But her uh, right him, you know, they're they're trying to have sex, and he keeps looking at the table, and there's just you know the picture sticking out of the folder, and it's the you know his dead first love's face. Yeah, that's gonna mean that he can't perform, you know. And at like at first she's like, do you want to talk about it? But then you know, yeah, then then she gets really mean spirited and and says, oh, you must be gay. I can, you know, I know someone else who's gay. Maybe you two should have sex with each other. You know, it's just like okay, I get that maybe she's like frustrated. It did you know the night didn't go exactly how she had hoped, but like yeah, it's just it's so messed up and yeah that is it for all of my notes so let me know hit me up in the comment section let me know what is your favorite time travel movie and why is it the terminator i mean it can't be everybody's favorite time travel movie it should be but it can't let me know which butterfly effect movie you thought was best do you think it would be good for them to eventually make a fourth one, even though it's been 13 years since they made a third one? Do you do you think that it would be cool if they made, like, Quantum Leap, but he's solving murders by, like, you know, Quantum Leap crossed with, like, an NCIS kind of thing? And, yeah. If you like this video, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. And let's see. And these videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. And I'll catch you next time.